Josiah Gilbert Holland, recalling famed newspaper columnist on 200th anniversary of his birth. Published July 31st, 2019, special to the Springfield Republican newspaper. By Michael Carolyn, read by the author. He was a household name for half a century. His columns turned the Springfield Republican into one of the most widely read newspapers in the country. His books sold so well in his lifetime that they made him a millionaire five times over. Springfield's own Josiah Gilbert Holland is arguably America's most overlooked celebrity man of letters. For starters, his 200th birthday anniversary this year is overshadowed by the bicentennials of his more canonized contemporaries, also born in 1819. Walt Whitman, and Herman Melville. It doesn't help that Holland's biographers have called him the major prophet of the unsophisticated. Turns out that the man no one remembers gave us more than we knew. The national myth of Lincoln's log cabin, arguably America's first realist novel, and an enduring moral compass for millions. There is no great achievement that is not the result of patient working and waiting goes one of his many, many pithy quips still found on the web, or God gives us, God gives every bird its food, but he does not throw it into the nest, as well as a mind grows by what it feeds on. As a book reviewer, the tall, dapper, walrus, mustachioed Holland disparaged Whitman and promoted Melville. He squabbled with Mark Twain over lecturing. And after he died suddenly of heart failure in New York City at age 62, poet Emily Dickinson comforted his widow. So beloved was he that on the anniversary of his death for more than three decades, friends at his office draped his portrait in the buried vines of the bittersweet, the title of one of his critically acclaimed poems. A critic remembered him thus, the guide, the philosopher, and schoolmaster of humanity at large, touching all questions of life and character. Indeed, scholars suggest that his uniquely American meteoric rise stemmed from how he deeply touched the public after the Civil War, a time when Americans increasingly moved from rural farm to urban factory. J.G., as he was known, became everyone's personal poet spiritual advisor in this period of great doubt and dislocation, according to Robert Skolnick, professor of English at William and Mary. He was best at eschewing denominational pulpit preaching. His social moral vernacular encouraged hard work, family values, and a common faith. His messaging went 19th century viral through the newspaper. The Republican seems to us like a letter from you, and we are, and we break the seal and read it eagerly, Dickinson wrote in her first of many letters to the Hollands. And there was humility, for his climb from poverty to fortune, as a biographer put it, J.G. must have thought to himself, there but for the grace of God goes Josiah Holland. But times changed. The loosening of collective Puritanical codes pushed him out. By 1910, the last of dozens of Holland literary clubs had ceased their monthly meetings. The public was through with the sentimental, melodramatic Victorian era moralizing. The critical backlash had begun. His literature was one of truisms insipid enough for a young lady's boarding school and religious enough for the most bigoted sectarian. Early Life Josiah Gilbert Holland was born in 1819 in a low slung farmhouse in the North Belchertown woods known then as Logtown. He later told a friend he'd like to buy the thing and burn it to the ground. He was the youngest of six children born to parents who were deeply religious, from pious Puritan stock. His father was a migratory ne'er-do-well, a failed inventor moving the family every year or two. Heath back to Belchertown, South Hadley, Granby, and Northampton. They were poor. So young Josiah went to work in a South Hadley woolen mill across 
Vermont teaching penmanship, daguerreotyping, and district school instruction. All three of his sisters died within months of each other, and so affected, Josiah attended medical school. By 1844, he established a practice in Springfield and quelled a minor epidemic. He sent his partner to heal a case so he could finish writing a poem and began an unsuccessful newspaper. Then he teamed with Dr. Charles Robinson, who later became governor of Kansas, and they established the area's first women's hospital, which went bankrupt after six months. In 1845, he married Elizabeth Chapin, of a prominent local family. There were three children, Annie, Kate, and Theodore. Cash-strapped and newlywed, Holland moved south to teach and landed as school superintendent at Vicksburg, Mississippi, joking that, with the paddle, he whipped more rebels than any other man in America. In 1848, he visited a Louisiana cotton plantation and wrote a seven-part semi-fictionalized travelogue. Its message Blacks did not suffer. Slavery reduces its white planting interest to misery. Holland was steadfastly conservative. He later argued for gradual emancipation, for women to remain in the home, and he believed with fervor that Catholic immigrants threatened American spiritual identity. The Springfield Republican on his return from the South, May 1849, Holland rode past the Republican office in an old and muddy perchback wagon with hardly a dollar in his pocket and saw owner-editor Samuel Bowles standing in the doorway. There is the place I want, J.G. said to himself. Bowles reportedly remarked at the same time, there is the man I want. For the next 17 years, Holland, as assistant editor and stockholder, wrote editorials and reported cattle shows, public meetings, caucuses, runaway horses, and the like. His writing helped make it the most influential paper in the country outside of New York. He began a series of advice letters under a pseudonym borrowed from Thackeray. After rejection, Timothy Titcomb's Letters to Young People, Single and Married, was published, and Holland began on the lecturing circuit often giving 80 appearances a year. He serialized his History of Western Massachusetts and published it as a book, followed with a novel. In 1857, The Bay Path, a tale of New England colonial life. In Springfield, he was a celebrity. He spoke for an hour at the old City Hall dedication, criticizing the city's lack of noteworthy architecture. Six years later, he built a handsome mansion overlooking the Connecticut, painted it red, and called it Brightwood, the name today of the neighborhood where it used to stand, 110 Atwater Terrace. An outspoken member of the North Congregational Church, he found the non-denominational memorial church in honor of his favorite deceased New England preachers. He loved to sing and compose hymns. He declared, what else did Puritanism do? It planted one of the most remarkable nations of the world in the wilderness. It gave the nation a love of freedom and justice a regard for the moral government of God, an open Bible, and a free pen and tongue. In 1851, Edward Dickinson, president of Amherst College, presented Dr. Holland with an honorary master's degree, after which his daughter, Emily, initiated an intimate friendship with Holland's wife, Elizabeth. Emily sent the couple poems embedded in her letters, yet Josiah reportedly found her style too ethereal to publish. J.G. Holland was more resistant to her poetry than Republican editor Samuel Bowles was, said Martha Nell Smith, an English professor and Dickinson scholar at the University of Maryland. He would have thought she was perhaps too unconventional. Holland then published his own poetry, the most successful, Bittersweet, in 1858. The Atlantic Monthly's distinguished editor James Russell Lowell called it a truly original poem. Biographer Harriet Merrick Plunkett described it as reflections on the mysteries of life and death, on the soul-racking problems of doubt and faith, on the existence of evil, on the whole haunting brood of Calvinistic theological metaphysics. Selling nearly 100,000 copies, the last edition emerged in 1923, two-thirds of a century after it first appeared 
and a generation after its author's passing. In 1860, he produced a realistic novel, Miss Gilbert's Career, an American Story, a full decade before, quote, the so-called pioneer American realistic novels began to publish, end quote, according to Harry Peckham, a Holland biographer, though it was not a good novel. Post-Civil War Years then, in April 1865, President Lincoln was assassinated. Five days later, Holland gave a public speech at City Hall. It was printed and sold quickly. Next, he created the first biography of The Inner Lincoln, a 544-page book that nine months later became an overnight bestseller in its day, with more than 100,000 copies. Critics argued that Holland took liberties, turning Lincoln into a Christian, which he was not. Today, it's known as one of the best early biographies. It featured the first detailed descriptions of the Lincoln log cabin with a lithographic image, the beginning of the myth-making that continues to this day. By 1868, his next poem, Katharina, appeared, and at 100,000 copies, it outsold every other American poem save Longfellow's Hiawatha. About the same time, Holland went to Europe. On returning, he co-founded Scribner's Magazine, Monthly, and bought a Park Avenue home in New York City. He unabashedly wrote about politics and religion, which was taboo at the time. In little more than a decade, he tripled the circulation and changed magazine wood engraving and illustration through technical advancements. From topics ranging from international copyright and religious liberalism, kindergarten instruction, and tenement house improvement, the magazine set the tone for the growing American middle-class readership. His later novels serialized included Arthur Bonnycastle, The Story of Seven Oaks, and Nicholas Minturn. Late in life, Holland bought one of the Thousand Islands on the St. Lawrence River in New York and built a luxury summer cottage there, naming it for the character Bonnycastle. Adoring readers came, quote, as though making a pilgrimage to a shrine, and carried away relics of every kind, begging sometimes for even a handful of pebbles out of the roadway as mementos." End quote. Holland spent October 11, 1881, at the office finishing an article about recently assassinated President James Garfield. The last words he penned, quote, might have been his own true epitaph, wrote biographer Plunkett. He wrote, quote, his Garland Garfield's sympathy with the humble drew to him the hearts of the world. The following morning, Miss Holland, with a groan so piercing that it betrayed mortal agony, fainted after finding her husband dead. I shall never forget the doctor's prayer my first morning with you, so simple, so believing. Dickinson wrote to Elizabeth Holland, devastated over the sudden loss of J.G., that God must be a friend. That was a different God, and I almost felt warmer myself in the midst of a tie so sunshiny. The End Editor's Note Honoring the 200th anniversary of Josiah Gilbert's Holland's birth, the Wood Museum of Springfield History is hosting a display of Holland photographs and books through the end of the year. Collections of his papers are at the New York Public Library, University of Colorado Boulder, and Harvard University. His granddaughter edited the collection, Emily Dickinson's Letters to Dr. and Mrs. Josiah Gilbert Holland, Harvard University Press, 1951. Holland Glen is a 30-acre nature preserve of forest and waterfalls in North Belchertown, near his birthplace.